All right, so we want to continue our series. Uh, we've been uh, uh, doing a series we started called Wisdom, and today we want to continue uh, talking about the wisdom of God in our lives. And today, part three, we we kind of continuing from last week where we looked at the difference between uh, earthly wisdom and godly wisdom. And uh, actually, earthly wisdom, James refers to it as demonic wisdom or devilish wisdom. And uh, we saw that. But this morning's subtitle is The Photo. How many of you know the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words? Have you heard that saying before? A picture is worth a, sa- a thousand words. And they say this, that the brain can process a photograph or an image within a hundred milliseconds. So images are powerful. They help us to identify or see something in a different light. And so this morning, I'm hoping that we can take a few photographs from the Word of God that will help us capture a moment, capture a lasting image of not just what the wisdom of God looks like, but what we will look like when we're walking in the wisdom of God. That's really important. And so uh, I'm going to ask you firstly to uh, join me in Proverbs chapter 3. And we're going to read a verse there, verse 13. And again, we're reading it from one of my current favorite translations, the TPT translation. And I've had so many people, I should have told you from week one what that means. It is the Passion Translation, if you're wondering. The Passion Translation. And uh, it's really like the Message Bible. It's a paraphrase. So it's not a study Bible. It's not a doctrinal Bible. You know, if you want a study Bible, you want to get a, a New King James Version, or you want to get the original King James. But this Bible is lovely because it puts the, the message into a contemporary setting and helps us to relate to it on a better level. So this is what verse 13 of Proverbs 3 says. Those who find true wisdom, please underline that, obtain the tools for understanding the proper way to live. So we could say it this way. Godly wisdom shows us how to live our lives properly. So if you're living in godly wisdom... You're going to live your life properly. Not only that, it says this. They will find a fountain of blessing pouring into their lives to gain the riches of wisdom is far greater than gaining the wealth of the world. Did you hear hear that this morning? Gaining the riches of wisdom is far greater than gaining the wealth of the world. The wealth of the world will fade away, but God's wisdom will not fade away. The wealth of the world will accomplish certain things, but the wealth of God's wisdom will accomplish everything. I don't know about you, but I would much rather have a great marriage, a great relationship with my children, and know I'm going to heaven than have a million dollars in the bank. How about this? I'd love to have both. but I'd much rather have the first one before I have the second one. Because the first one will bring you the second one, but God will not add sorrow with it. Can you say amen? As a matter of fact, you and I in Christ are the most wealthiest people on this earth. Because you know why? Whatever your need is this morning, Jesus can meet it. So, we're going to look at some, uh, some things this morning that I think will help us. Last week, we looked at some of the Greek words for, for the word wisdom. Uh, one of the words we looked at was the Greek word phronesimos. Uh, another word we'll probably look at next week is the Greek word sophia. But this morning, I want us to focus on something else just for a minute. Wherever you see wisdom in the Bible, very close to that, you'll see the opposite. You'll see the Bible has a lot to say about foolishness. It has a lot to say about being a fool in your life and how that will take you down a road you don't want to go. So I want to just quickly give you the definition of the word fool from the Hebrew word. Because if we understand that, it'll give us insight in what it means to not be wise. And that's going to help us to grow in the wisdom of God. So one of the words uh, for the word foolish in the Hebrew language, which is the Old Testament Proverbs, uh, there's two words there. The one word is the word kesil, and the other word is the Hebrew word nabal, and this is what it means. It means to be silly or to be childish. Proverbs says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. What it's saying is children are childish, 
and they are silly. The, the word nabal means actually this. It means to wilt or to fall away, to fail or to faint. So, so if I operate in foolishness, it means I'm going to wilt away. I'm going to fall short of who I can be. I'm not going to live up to the expectations that God has for my life or that I have for my own life. But here's the interesting thing. In the Greek, the Greek word for the word fool is the word morose. Uh, we don't even have to explain it after that because there's an English word called morose, which means to be sad, unhappy, to be overly serious. And so the word here in the Greek means this. Please write this down. It means to be dull. In other words, someone who's foolish is dull. In other words, uh, we could say it this way, there's a lift but it doesn't go all the way to the top. The light's on but nobody's home. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what it's trying to explain. As a matter of fact, it goes on and it says this, the word foolish in the Greek word means to be blunt, to be headless, and listen to this in brackets, it actually says this, to be a blockhead. So would you just look at the person next to you and say to them, you don't look like a blockhead. (laughs) Uh, Some of you were pausing, you're like, "Mm, let me first hear. So it paints this picture. It paints this picture that a fool is someone who has clouded thinking. They're not thinking properly about the things in their lives and the decisions they're making, and so it makes them a fool. So in James chapter 3, let's dig in where we left off last week, and let's turn to verse 17. James chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. And last week we looked at, at, at the earthly or the worldly wisdom. Now we're going to look at the godly wisdom where we, where we left off last week. And in verse 17 and 18 it says, But the wisdom that is from above, say above. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. We can immediately see that godly wisdom is a whole nother level to worldly wisdom. Can you say amen to that? Godly wisdom is a whole nother level. As a matter of fact, godly wisdom elevates you and I to a better place in our lives. Would you just say this with me? Say, I am going higher. Come on, look at the person next to you. Say, I am going higher. Why are you going higher? Because I'm connecting my life and I'm growing in the wisdom of God. If you grow in the wisdom of God, it will bring you to a better place in your life. So let's take our first picture this morning. Our first photograph we want to look at as we dig into the word of God this morning is a photograph of purity. A photograph of purity. James says this, the wisdom of God is firstly pure. Now when I think of the word pure and I connect it to wisdom, what does the word pure give you a picture of? It speaks about something that is clean. Uh, I, I would have thought of immediately drinking water that is uncontaminated. That, that water is pure and therefore because it's pure it's fit for consumption. You can drink it and it will build you up and it will edify you and it will do you good. And so we see here that the wisdom of God brings with it purity into my life. And if I want to have the wisdom of God operating in my life, I need to grow in my life of purity. Because if I'm walking in the wisdom of God, what will start to happen as it takes root in my life, it will start to clean me up. Look at the person next to you say, Clean you up. So what does that mean to be clean this morning? To to, to be connected to the wisdom of God means that I'm starting to grow in purity and in cleanliness. Well, it means this if we if we study and think about it, it means we are not pretending to be something, but we are sincere in our walk with God. 
There's a genuineness about our walk with God. And listen, there's a genuineness about our walk with God and applying God's word to our lives. There's so many people in the church today, they just come to church to be in the church. So they can say, well, I went to church this week. Or they just come to church so that they can meet their buddies, because their buddies also go to church. But I want you to know today, if we are genuine, if we are sincere about tapping into the wisdom of God, it means that we're not pretending. There's a genuineness, there's a purity. God's wisdom isn't something I do, it's something I become. Please write that down, and if you've got Twitter or Facebook, that's a tweetable twit. (laughs) I don't mean you, I mean that's a tweet you can tweet. Or it's a Twitter that you can tweet. God's wisdom isn't something... So in other words, listen, I don't wait till I'm in trouble, then say, God, give me wisdom, and then think God's going to chuck wisdom at me, I'm going to apply it to my life, and then I'm going to go back to being a fool. No. Wisdom is something you're becoming. It's got to become part of your lifestyle. It's got to become part of who you are, because when it becomes part of who you are, it'll start to clean your life out. It'll start to cause you to elevate. It'll start to cause you to think differently and act differently about everything that you're doing in your life. It'll cause you to think differently about your marriage and your partner. It'll cause you to think differently about your family, about your business, about your work, about your church, about your calling. Why? Because you're becoming more like Christ. So we can say this then, it's not wise for you and I to play with sin or to just settle for living in the day-to-day fleshly lifestyle that the world lives in. Some people today are just playing church. They're pretending. Look at the person next to you say, don't be a pretender. And I said to you, this message is going to be a tough message, but the reality is this, church, we've got to grow in our lives. We've got to get to a place where we allow the grace of God to work in us, otherwise we're hindering godly wisdom from being effective in our lives. And I believe God is calling us as a church. Have a look what what, uh, Paul said to the church in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 6. He says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. That word mature there means to be pure. It means to be an adult. It means to be of understanding. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Isn't that amazing? When you start to operate in the wisdom of God, you start to live life in a spiritual realm that empowers you daily to live a practical lifestyle. And he says it so beautifully. He says, we speak wisdom to those who are mature, not the wisdom of this age, because the wisdom of this age is passing away and coming to nothing. Paul says in another place later on, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, which is the love chapter. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, what did I do? I put away childish things. Can I talk to you this morning as your pastor? Is that okay with you? It's time for you and I to take the childish things of our lives and go put them away. Put them in the cupboard, put the lock on the cupboard and throw away the key. And I started to think about this as I've been praying uh, into this message and just applying it to my own life. And I'm not there, but I want to get there. Amen. I'm sincere about getting there. God is calling us to maturity. God is calling us to grow up. Now, he's not just calling us to grow up as individuals. Because how you know, in the church, you're always going to have a whole different range of, of spiritual growth because people who just get saved this morning, they're going to be spiritual babes. They've still got to grow with God. And then you've got some people who have been saved a year and they're a little bit further in their walk with God. And then you've got people who've been serving God for 10 years and they're going to be at a different phase. So what maturity is God talking about? He's saying church. Rhema South Coast Family Church. It's time you mature and you grow up as a church, 
and start walking in your calling and your gifting and, and in what God has called you to do. In other words, touch the person next to you and say, playing games is over. <laughs> I could say it like this. When the church was born, it was a baby. How you know the baby started to grow and then it started to crawl? And how many of you know after it started to crawl, it started to walk, it learned to walk. And then the church grew up and it became a teenager. Well, here's the thing. The church isn't a teenager anymore. It's now become an adult. And it's time for us to start walking and talking and being who God's called us to be. And so Paul starts to speak to us and he says, listen, if you want to become the wisdom of God, you've got to put away childish things. You've got to grow up and you've got to start taking your responsibilities as a child of God to do the things of God. So how do I mature this morning as a believer? Well, the first thing is, and I'm not going to talk on maturity today, but I just want to give you this one thing. If you start here, you'll be well on your way to growing as a believer and becoming mature in Christ, is the number one thing you've got to do is you've got to receive Christ's love for your life. Do you know this morning that God is is love, that God is 100% committed to you for your life? He's 100% committed to you. He loves you unconditionally. As a matter of fact, I like to say it like this. Christ's love is amazing because it changes you on the inside. Amen. I remember when I got saved and the love of God came into me. The people, when I walked into church that day, the people I didn't like, when I left church that day after getting saved, I liked them. Amen. Amen. Why? Because the love of God came into my heart. And the people who I thought, you know, would never get anywhere, suddenly I saw their potential. Why? Because the love of God broke all the shackles in my own life. That's what the love of God will do. And so after Christ's love comes into you, after you receive God's love, and I don't know about you, you need to receive God's love for your life every single day. The first thing you do in the morning, before you have your coffee, while your kettle's boiling, you should be standing there saying, Father, thank you. This is the day that you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Day, Daddy God, today I receive your love for my life. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you're on my side. Thank you today. Your favor is working for me. Amen. Amen. Why? You're receiving the love of God. Now, when you do that, you know what will happen. You'll fall in love with Jesus. And when you fall in love with Jesus, I want you to know he'll be the most important thing in your life. And I know the church sometimes says, well, love Jesus. No, no, first receive his love. Because when you receive his love, it's easy to love him back. And you know what? When you love God back, when you love Jesus back, you can start applying the love of God to all your relationships. When people are ugly to you, you'll know how to love them. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. By the Holy Spirit. And you know what? You'll start to mature. Now, I'm going somewhere with this this morning. Have a look at verse 7. We read verse 6. I'll read it again. It says, Paul says this, However we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now remember last week we said this. The wisdom of God isn't hidden from you, it's hidden for you. But why does the the wisdom of God be hidden for you as the church? Because you have to be born again to tap into the wisdom of God for your life. Not only must you be born again, but you've got to be a growing believer. You've got to be on a journey with God. You've got to be pure and sincere in your Pursuit of God. Verse 8 says, Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Listen to this. God knows who you are. God knows where you need to be. God knows what he wants to do in your life. But sometimes he hides that. Why? Because if the enemy knew what God was going to do in your life, he'd try and stop it. Look what it says. It says, If they knew that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was going to be slain for the salvation of the world, they wouldn't have killed him. So he had to hide that wisdom from them. But how do you know Jesus knew it? 
because he was walking and cooperating with the call and gifting of God on his life. Verse 9, but as it is written, please write this down. This is such a powerful scripture for you today. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Wow. God has things prepared for our lives. Why? Because we love him. And why do we love him? Because he loved us first. Now look at verse 10. Remember we read in verse 7 that it's hidden wisdom. Now look at verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. So how do I tap into the wisdom of God, that hidden wisdom of God? I tap into it by yielding and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life. He'll unlock the wisdom of God. And you know what? Romans 8 verse 13 says, those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You know what that word sons is in the Greek? Huos. It's the mature son. There's a growth and a maturity that comes into our lives where we're led by the Holy Spirit. How many you know the goosebumps are gone? The excitement's gone? You're just living life normally, but inwardly you're led by the Holy Spirit. How you know there was a day where we wanted to be led by goosebumps? Oh, I just felt the anointing past it was so lacquer. Well, what about when you don't feel the anointing? Are you going to stop serving God? No, no. No, no, you're going to keep serving because now you mature and you've grown and you realize that everything God does, he does inwardly from the spirit. And you don't need little goosebumps to make you feel good. And it's great when we get the goosebumps, amen? But we're not pursuing that. We're not following that. What are we following? We're following God's call on our lives. We're following God's wisdom in our lives. We're following the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we're committed to becoming who God wants us to become. Look at the person next to you. Say, we're committed. There's something God wants us to become as a church that will be the expression of God's love and wisdom in our lives and in our community. And if we tap into that, you know what? It releases everything else in your life that you need. That's why it's important to belong to a local church, to, be, to put your roots down in a local church where God has planted you. So this photo today is very important. And, and I want to I wanna give you the second photograph that goes with that today. You need to see yourself full of the wisdom of God. Don't see yourself as lacking wisdom. See yourself as full with the abundance of wisdom. Say in Jesus' name, I am full with abundance of the wisdom of God in my life. All right, so we said firstly, the wisdom of God is firstly pure. That means there's a cleanliness that comes with the wisdom of God that starts to clean my life out. It starts to give me a desire and a passion. The other thing that I believe this word pure is saying is it also speaks about being authentic. Being authentic and being genuine. You know, Christians need to be real. Look at the person next to you and pinch them and say, are you real this morning? (laughs) You know what drew, do you know what drew people to Jesus? It was his genuineness. He he had an authenticity about his life that was real. And people loved being around him. Why? Because he wasn't religious. He was just Jesus. They could see the power of God. They could see the authority of God. But they could also see the love of God shining through him. And they realized this, that he would confront them when they were wrong. He would would deal with things when they were. But he'd also love them and walk with them and care about them. And how many of you know they hated being around the religious people? The Pharisees and Sadducees, you know why? Because they were sad, you see. (laughs) They were sad. They were miserable about everything. And you know what? More than ever before today, more than ever before, the world is looking for the genuine product. They want the real deal, amen? We need, to, we need to develop and realize that Christ in you is the hope of glory. It's not you. 
You're not such a big deal. Amen. You're not the bee's knees. You're just a normal human who serves a supernatural God. Amen. Amen. And you can be real about your life. He goes on in verse 13. He says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. In other words, let me say it like this. Being authentic means this. We're not perfect, but we're progressive. Amen? Look at the person next to you. Say, I'm not perfect, but I'm progressive. I'm not where I want to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Amen? Sometimes you measure your maturity not by where you've arrived, but from where you've climbed. Amen? God has redeemed us from the miry pit of clay. And you know, I remember when I got saved and I even look back over my life two or three or four or five years ago and man, I had so many things wrong in my life. I needed every Christian book, every Christian psychologist, every Christian tape in my life because my life was a mess. How many of you can relate when you got saved? Anybody know where I'm coming from this morning? But you know what? Each time I took a step of faith, and I leant in towards God, God leant into me. And I started to grow. And his wisdom would pour into my life. And I was able to deal with this thing in my life, and I got victory. And every time I got victory, I grew in wisdom. I remember, listen, I'm not proud of this, but I'll tell you this because I think it'll help some of you. You know, the first person I witnessed to, would you like to know the first person I witnessed to after I got saved? Was a friend of mine from the army, and we went out drinking together. After I got saved. I know, look at the person next to you say, huh? <laughs> and I was drunk. I had one glass too many of wine. I was drunk, but I was witnessing to him. I was telling him about Jesus and he needs to come to church with me tomorrow because oh, God's going to save you. <laughs> I didn't just have the spirit, I had the other spirit. <laughs> and why am I telling you that? Because you know what? God used my drunken testimony and that guy got saved. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Here's the problem with that. If I'm still drinking 10 years down the road and I'm still trying to witness drunk, there's something wrong. Because why? I had to grow from there. I was, I was just saved. I was still learning. And the first thing God dealt with in my life was my mouth. I had such a dirt, dirty mouth. The day I got saved, I stopped swearing. It was like a miracle God did in my life. He probably knew, listen, let me just take that foul mouth away from you because that's going to get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> but I you know I was still smoking. I was still drinking. I still had some bad attitudes. I still had a whole lot of stuff in my life that needed to be dealt with. But you know, as I grew in wisdom, God brought cleanliness. And that's what being authentic, uh, being authentic is about. It's not about being perfect, but it's about growing from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory, from one level of wisdom to the next level, level of wisdom. Touch the person next to you and say, how are you doing? You don't have to tell them. You see, Pastor Ray said this once, and it helped me so much. I've remembered it all these years, it's helped me so much. He said this, Larry, don't be scared of making mistakes, but learn from where you are today and you'll get up tomorrow and you'll have a greater level of wisdom which will give you a better chance of victory in the future. Amen? So if you're in a bad place this morning, like William said in the communion, don't get discouraged, don't get condemned, don't get down on yourself, but listen, don't stay there either. Say, God, I need wisdom for this time of my life. And I want to pursue you. I want to grow in my life. I want to become an example. I want to be the next Solomon. No amens. Okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> I was hoping I'd have one Solomon in the church, you know. You do know this, hey, that, that Americans studied it recently and they said this, that Solomon's wealth would dwarf the top 10 wealthiest people in the world today. So I'm going to try that again. Why don't you trust God to be the next Solomon? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. I just believe God's going to give you your, 
your promise, God's going to do that in your life as long as you make a commitment to tithe to Ramah South Coast Family Church. Amen. 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 But listen, why can't God do that for you? Why can't God do that for us? Because you know, when you become the wisdom of God, God will lift your life up. Why? Because you'll become a testimony. You won't take the glory, you'll give it to God. Amen. You'll say, you know what? I'm blessed. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going down, out. Amen. Why? Because God's good. Amen. You know, there's a, a scripture in the New Testament that says God will use the Gentiles to make the Jews jealous. I don't know too many Jews that are jealous of the Gentiles because they know who their God is. Amen. And they believe in the covenant of wealth and the covenant of success. Anyway, I don't know how I got off on that one. But here's the thing. Let's be honest, let's be real, and let's keep serving God today. And you know what? He'll move us forward in success. The second picture I want to take before we close this morning, and I'll, I'll race through this one with my last five minutes, is the second photograph is that wisdom is always connected to peace. Right? So the first one is wisdom is pure. But secondly, wisdom is connected to peace. You'll go see those two verses. Peace is used three times. And I want you to know that godly wisdom is always rooted in the peace of God. When you become grounded and rooted in the peace of God, what happens is inwardly, you stop striving and trying to make things happen and you start resting in the sufficiency of Christ for your life. And you allow Him to win your battles. You allow him to deal with things and what you do is you cooperate with him. And if you'll learn to walk in peace, I want you to know you'll become friendly to the wisdom of God and the wisdom of God will attach itself to your life and you'll see the wisdom of God flying out of your life. Are you getting some help this morning? So let me quickly go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We've been reading from verse 6. I want you to listen to what Paul started this chapter saying. And you'll be amazed at his attitude. Look here in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with the excellence of speech or of the wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. Look at verse 2. But I determined not to know anything among you except... Jesus Christ and him crucified. Look at the next statement. This is so powerful. I was with you in weakness. I was with you in fear. I was with you in much trembling. And my speech and preaching was not with the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit of God and the power of God. Look at verse 5. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Wow. Wow. Paul said, listen, I'm, I'm one of the most sturdiest and studied and degreed person, but I came to you in fear, in trembling and humility because I didn't want to preach in man's wisdom. I didn't want your faith to be in the wisdom of Larry. I want your faith to be in the wisdom and the power of God because it's the power of God that will change your life. It's the power of God that will set you alive. It's the power of God that will deliver you. It's the power of God that will break the strongholds in your life. It's the power of God that will change our nation. It's the power of God that will revolutionize your marriage. It's the power of God that will make you wealthy like Solomon. And Paul said, what I'm going to preach is I'm going to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I'll let God do the rest. Amen? The demonstration of the power. You see, listen, faith releases the power of God and the power of God will produce the peace of God and the peace of God will bring the wisdom of God. Look at the person next to you. Say, how's your peace this morning? I don't have time, but in Romans 5, you can go read it, the first five verses. I'll just read the first two. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Because of Jesus this morning, you have peace with God. Stop striving in your life. Stop trying to make things happen. Stop trying to be someone. Just let the peace of God come, and God will take you where you need to go. Let it flow from within you. Let the peace of God guard your heart. You see, if I could say it this way, don't let anything steal your peace this morning. You see, because when the devil gets your peace, the next thing he'll take is your joy, and the next thing he'll take is your hope, and then your faith is gone and you have nothing with which to go forward. 
So what is peace? Peace in the Greek is the word irene, and it actually means this, to have a calmness of heart and mind. It means to have a calmness of heart and mind. It devotes, denotes a quality of well-being, tranquility, harmonious relationships, and the absence of strife. You see, true, true peace can only come from the Prince of Peace. In Luke 1 verse 79, uh, John the Baptist made this statement that he will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and he'll guide our feet into the way of peace. What is Jesus doing this morning? He's guiding our way into the, he's guiding our feet into the way of peace. He has, he has the powerful thing about peace. When peace lives in us, we become way easier or it becomes easier to find solutions to our problems and we look to be a blessing to others instead of always trying to get our own way. When you're walking in peace, you don't have to try and get your own way because you know what? God's got this. So it becomes easier to find solutions. Now here, let me, let me encourage you with this and I don't want to rush this. If you lose your peace, it's sometimes an indication that you're starting to walk in the flesh because you're trying to work things out in your own ability. Number two, when you lose your peace, sometimes it's an indication that you're allowing circumstances or people to get inside of you. Number three, when you start losing your peace, it may mean that God is trying to say to you, it's time to get back into my presence again and just worship me. When you lose your peace, number four, it may be an indication that you're facing something and God requires you to get into your prayer closet and pray in the spirit until you sense the peace come back into your life. Amen? Are you getting some help this morning? I'm nearly done. Uh, I'm going to just do uh, what any good pastor would do. Could I just have five more minutes this morning just to finish? Put up your hand if I could just have five minutes, please. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. You guys fall for it all the time. Okay, I'm nearly done. When we are at peace, we become willing to yield and listen to other people's opinions, feelings, and suggestions, and we way easier, it's way easier for us to be receptive to what God is saying in a situation. I was sitting with one of our leaders this week. We had a situation to face and a decision we need to make. And this person that was involved in this did something which really made us angry. And we wanted to react to this, and we had a legal right to react. As a matter of fact, we were sitting at the Blue, Blue Lagoon having coffee, and this person said to me, you know what, I think we need to go and see a lawyer, and let's just find out how we're going to deal with this. And we were talking, but we were at peace. We were like, God, just show us what to do. By the end of that coffee and, and conversation, we realized that the person who did this thing did it by accident. They did it inadvertently. And so you know what we did? I said to this person, just go visit that person, talk to them, let's find out what actually happened and give them an opportunity. And when we spoke to them, we realized they didn't even know they'd done something wrong. They copied and pasted something and they didn't know that our, um, our uh, letterheads were embedded in that thing that they copied and pasted. So the person was so upset, I'm so sorry, wrote a letter of apology. Now imagine if we didn't use godly wisdom and we didn't keep our peace, we would have reacted, sent a lawyer's letter and now started another whole thing of motions which would have been absolutely unnecessary. But we let the peace of God rule in our hearts. When we're at peace, it helps us to take responsibility for our own growth and our own development, instead of looking at everybody else and saying, well, if they did this, and if they didn't do that, if they would just get that right. No, take responsibility for your own life. So I'm going to ask you to stand this morning as we close. And the third photograph I want you to look at is I've taken a snapshot of a couple of scriptures this morning, and I want us to just read them out aloud uh, for the next few minutes as we close this morning. We're going to bring up some soft music, and here we're going to read these scriptures out aloud. Are you ready? Psalm 85, verse 8. Let's read it out together. Number one. One, two, three. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Isaiah 26, verse 3. One, two, three. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Isaiah 54, verse 10. One, two, three. 
For the mountains will depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. John 14 verse 27. 1, 2, 3. I leave the gift of peace with you, my peace, not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your heart. Instead, be courageous. And finally, Philippians 4 verse 7 says this, 1, 2, 3. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your heart and your mind safe in Christ Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, just for the next 20 seconds. If you're here today, and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, and you want to be born again today, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, right where you are, just raise your hand nice and high, that I know I need to say a prayer for you today. We're going to pray the prayer of salvation. And if you want to accept and acknowledge Christ as your Savior, you've never done that, or maybe you did it once, but you backslid and you, you're out of fellowship with God, and you want to give your life and rededicate your life today, just raise your hand wherever you are so that I know I need to pray for you. Is there one person? God bless you right at the back there. Ma'am, thank you so much. Is there someone else? There's another hand over there. God bless you right at the back there, ma'am. That is awesome. God is drawing in his people. Is there someone else? Once you've raised your hand, you can put it down. As a matter of fact, if you raised your hand right now, I'm going to ask you to just take your personal belongings and just walk from where you are to the back of the building. There's a leader there that wants to pray with you and for you. Will you do that? You raise your hand. Just walk with me to the back. And we're just going to pray together before we take you to a place of prayer. Isn't that awesome? Three people gave their hearts to the Lord this morning. Uh, Richard, if you'll just keep them there, we're just going to pray together. And I'm going to ask the church to pray out loud with me. Say, Father God, I believe today Jesus Christ is your son, that he died for my sin, and that you raised him from the dead so that I could be saved. I receive Christ Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me today. Amen. You are now born again. Let's give the Lord praise for those folks today. Hallelujah. That is so awesome.